In the last genetics lesson, we'll be looking at genetic engineering, which is also referred to as genetic modification. So this is not really a practice that many breeders do, but your big time breeders, people with uh, capital, they can use genetic modification to alter maybe their livestock, but generally this method is actually used in plant breeding. So basically what this thing is, this method is, is manipulating genes to change the phenotype of an organism. So that's mainly the point. If, let's say, your herd or um, breeds or, or um, yeah, certain breed or a certain plant strain is, doesn't look a certain way that we want, maybe it's not big enough, tasty enough, um, you're tall enough, all those different traits, it can be genetically manipulated to change the genotype and then in essence change the phenotype. So here you can see, uh, which is an example, plants can be used inside the leaves, we see different cells, inside the cells we see the cells, and with all the chromosomes um, inside the nucleus. And all these chromosomes are made up of a long string of DNA, uh, with segments of genes in between, and here we have the DNA sequence. Here is your basis, um, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. So we can change that, the different um, bases, and with that we can change the phenotype of an individual. So why would we want to make GMO organisms, which means genetically modified organism? Um, so basically the first thing is why we want to do that is to make individuals more disease resistant. So this could be for livestock or for um, plant types. They need to make them more herbicide, uh, to allow them to be more tolerant to herbicides. This is mainly for plants. And here we can see in the picture are different areas that can be manipulated or when genetically they manipulate the different um, features of them phenotypically on the outside gets changed to help. So certain areas of the leaves, leaves can become tougher. The stomata on the leaves can change depending on whether they're open or closed. If they're closed, they lose less water, so it can be more um, drought resistant, meaning when usually when it's hot, the uh, evaporation happens quicker, so then they lose more water. But if the stomata are closed, they lose less water, so that can be adapted. Um, also with the cell membranes, how it allows water to move in and out. Um, how the roots also are adapted. So certain areas get changed as we change its DNA. Then also um, improved nutrition, so meaning will the plants generally um, taste better? This can be true for livestock as well. Um, what is the meat like? How fat is the animal? This all, ha all has to do with their genes, uh, well 50-50, with the environment as well and also the genes. But the genes at least we can try and manipulate. Um, if for say we can't manipulate the environment and also it allows um, certain individuals to be more cold or drought resistant and especially with your crop types it increases yield so generally maize is a pretty good example maize used to be very small the cobs and then with uh, genetic changes we've actually enlarged the cob and also increased the amount of kernels um, the small yellow seeds on the maize so again, that is the food we eat. The more kernels we have on a cob, the more there is to eat. Then also we have increased the size. This can be true for livestock as well as crop types. The bigger the size, the more there is to eat, basically. So there are many, many benefits actually to GMO um, products. Then also, what then are the risks? They love asking you guys, why should we actually not do this? Or why are some people against GMO products and genetically modified organisms? Now, the first thing is it actually reduces biodiversity. And with this could be, could be meant genetic diversity as well. So genetic diversity, they start with that, meaning the alleles, there are less alleles, less variation. So generally this could be bad for when the environment changes again and then the individuals maybe could all die because all of them are genetically similar. Then with reduced biodiversity, it could be here in this picture, here we see a variety of different daisy types. So again, this all comes back to genetic diversity actually because all of the different alleles gives you a variety of different biological products. So again, if there are less genes, because we've been selecting for a certain type, maybe we've been selecting all of them to look like this daisy, then eventually we will never get any of the other variations because there are no genes or alleles that can create them to look like this if we select for them to be like this. So then also there could be some health risks like, and it can cause allergies in our bodies. 
Um, this could be with livestock that we do eat, but generally this is more to do with plant types. So here we have certain pollen types that some people are allergic to. We get rashes, we get runny noses, and it makes our eyes water. Yes, fine, it's not really a deadly thing if um, the plants do give us allergies, but in certain cases, it depends on how severely allergic someone is to something, it could actually potentially cause the death of someone, especially if they struggle to breathe, because sometimes you, um, it affects the lungs, and then they can't breathe anymore, and then they go into shock. So yes, it does have actually some serious health risks, mild to serious. So it depends on how we change it. Sometimes genetically, if we do alter something too much, it can cause allergies. Then also, there could be some pest resistance. So this is actually, um, it could be a good thing, but it could also be bad, meaning it depends on what uh, pest is trying to get to what type of plant. Um, I'm trying to think, maybe pest resistance is actually a good thing here. But pest resistance, is, oh no, no, pest resistance in the sense of that the pests now are tolerant to the plant. So we've manipulated the plant in such a way that certain types of pests can actually get to the plant. And there's no way for the plant now to, uh, to defend itself against pests. I think that's actually what I quite meant with that one. So then we have economic concerns. So with our economic concerns, usually it's expensive, or the expensive parts of the products. In this case, when we have changed genetically certain organisms, the companies who actually have changed these organisms, they usually put a trademark on these changed genes and plants, and then they again ask a lot of money for crops and breeders and farmers to use their seeds or to plant their plants in their crop farms. So it could be economically expensive because now these laboratories and um, breeders and scientists have done the work, they've changed the genes, changed the way these crop types and species look, and now they charge the, the rest of the world a lot of money to actually use their crop type or their plants or their animals that they've changed. So economically this could be a bad thing. So then there are certain techniques that breeders and scientists are can use to genetically manipulate certain organisms. So with this, you guys will just have to be able to identify the different types and maybe write in, in a sentence or two what this technique evol involves, basically. So I evol uh, put in some diagrams to explain it, but you will not have to draw anything. Just know the names and just know in a sentence or two how to explain what happens during this technique. So the first one is electroporation. So electro, we must make you think of electricity, and that's exactly what it's used here. So basically what happens is an electric pulse will cause new DNA or the gene that you want to put into this plant type or um, animal organism, diffuse then with the cells, the host's original DNA. So if we wanted to change the DNA, let's say of the maize plant, the maize is too small, now we change one of its alleles to enable it to make bigger offspring. So we want to put that new piece of DNA into this organism. Well, how do we put that in? And that is with an electrical shock. So here we see um, basically what electrical charge is on the inside of the cell, uh, and the electrical charge on the outside. It's basically positive and negative all around. And here we see that the green bits are the new DNA we want to put inside the cell. There's nothing in here yet. There's nothing on the new DNA. It doesn't have its own DNA. But we want to put the DNA around here inside the cell. So what happens? We put an electrical shock in here. So with that, we change the, the, the positive and the negative. We change the charge. This one, the important charge, basically, that happens inside and outside the cell. And what happens when um, all the negative ions actually accumulate on this side and all the positive on this side actually opens the cell membrane. So the electrical shock opens the cell membrane and now the DNA that was on the outside of the cell can come into the cell because the cell membrane has opened. So basically what the electrical shock does is make a little pathway so that the genes can come inside. And now at the end, when you're done, this, the, what they say here, the membrane heals. So the membrane fuses closed again and now it keeps the DNA particles on the inside. And then usually after a while, the cell will replicate again and will try and um, uh, multiply, and with that, the DNA then will multiply it inside, and in that case, we have a new organism with the changed DNA. The second technique that they can use is micro injection. So, as the word says, injection, you literally inject the new gene into the cell. As you can see in the picture, it's the genes are injected.
injected into the nucleus of the recipient cell. Here we have the cell, here's the nucleus, put the DNA on the inside. You literally use a specialized um, needle, injection needle, to do it. So again, it kind of looks like a normal injection needle here, but it does look a little bit different in real life. But in essence, this explains what happens. So this needle then injects the DNA straight through into the nucleus. Then lastly, we have the gene gun, also known as bioballistics. So they can either use either one of these two terms in the test, or you can use either one. So generally, when they ask you what um, equipment is used in bioballistics, then you'll see it say the gene gun. If they do not say this, you can use either one, gene gun or bioballistics, if they want you to identify this technique. So then what does this technique do? It basically takes metal slivers containing the DNA and shoots it into the recipient cell. So here it shows you a metal particle or gold, gold particle in this case. It could be gold, silver, platinum, whatever they use. I think gold actually is the best. So they use a piece of DNA. This is the DNA with the specific, the codes for specific characteristics that you want to place into that organism. So then it fuses with the metal plating. It actually keeps it close. And then here is, actually this is what the gun actually looks like, what they use. So this is the gun they put in here and then they shoot it, not like this. You hold it closer to the animal, but anyway, you shoot it physically into the organism that you want to change. And then it goes into the cells of this organism. So that's basically in a nutshell that happens with this. So it's actually quite fascinating to see in real life. And that is it for the genetics topic.